Spawn peeking in Siege is a great way to gain man advantage early in the round, but it's also a great way to lose man advantage as well. Damn! Because of this, you want to make sure that you're spawn peeking carefully and correctly and in a place that you know you're not going to die. Now that was just one out of 16 tips that I'll be going over in today's video. The second of which being that your placing rotates wrong. There are some times where you make rotates that need to be crouch height, sprint height, and even vaultable. And depending on which site you go to is going to depend on which rotate you're going to make. If you're going to a site where it's actually very rare for them to get into the site, like kitchen on clubhouse, then a sprinting rotate is the best so that you can use it to rotate the fastest possible. If you're using a rotate that you need to peek off of, like on the site for hookah on coastline, then you need to make a vaulting rotate because a vaulting rotate is tall and allows you to peek off of it while also giving you a little cover if you crouch beneath it. And then a normal rotate would go pretty much anywhere on most sites that you're not using the other two rotates that I just went over. Now that's a really, really common mistake, but my third tip is even more common, which is droning too much. In a fast paced TDM meta, we're getting a lot of kills all the time. Again, very fast paced droning, can be really good to initially get you into the building, but if you're droning too much, you're going to lose pace with your team, and you're inevitably going to lose the round because you're across the map droning when your team is inside taking gunfights. So droning is a good thing that you should do, but if you drone too much, you'll actually just be wasting a lot of time, which is really, really bad for you. This droning trope is exactly why operators like Flores and Brava, who used to be very good operators, are now highly situational due to the fact that people aren't playing them often because their gadget is just too slow to use whenever their team is just rushing in and they're still on a drone in spawn. Now I'm by zero means saying that these operators are bad, they're still good operators, but you just have to match the pace of your team. Which brings me into my fourth tip, you might be picking the wrong operator. If your team looks like they're doing a rush heavy comp, they're playing Ash, Finca, or any other operators that are fast paced in this TDM meta, then picking operators that are three armors that drone a lot, like I said earlier, or support operators when you know they're rushing the site isn't going to do anything. I'll give you another example let's say you're playing ace or thermite and you're trying to get a wall open but your team brings no emps and they're rushing and they don't have a thatcher now your intent might be good by bringing a hard reacher to get the wall open but it's just going to be as useless as a teammate who's not bringing any utility at all because you're not going to be able to use that utility without any emps on your team so as much as it sucks to not be able to play the operators that you want, it's better to flex and pick the operators that your team needs depending on what they're doing so that you can win more rounds and inevitably more games. As a support main in a TDM meta, this can suck a lot. But if your team is helping you get the wall open, that will bring me into my fifth tip, which is getting a wall open before getting into a position. If you're an OSA main, you know exactly what I'm talking about here. Osa, for example, has EMPs and a shield. Now, as an Osa player, you don't want to put your shield down after the wall has been opened, because when you put your shield down, the sides of your body and your feet are exposed and you can die from that. But if you put your shield down and you and your teammates get into position to take gunfights before the wall opens, then when the wall opens, if any defenders are immediately peeking, you can easily kill them and not as easily get killed yourself. This is the same thing for Maverick and why Maverick is so hard to play for newer players. Maverick's very hard because you have to open the wall and also be in a safe position when you're opening the wall and then also have a safe position after you're done opening the wall when you run away. So getting a route of where you're going to go after the wall is opened or getting in an advantageous position so you can take gunfights when the wall does open is very very nice and it's something that a lot of low elo players don't do that can cost them their life. Now that was just 5 out of 16 tips, and these tips get crazier and crazier as the video goes on. And the last one, I guarantee every single person makes the mistake of doing, so you have to watch to the end to see it. Now speaking of throwing your life away, let's go over playing your life too much, which is my 6th tip. A position that you commonly will play your life in is a position like rafters in clubhouse, if you're an Azami or a Wamai player. Now, just in case you don't know what playing your life is, playing your life is essentially saying, I'm going to hold this room until I die and waste as much time as possible. Rafters and Clubhouse is such a good example of this because if the attackers take Rafters, they essentially have a free plant in CC. So most players will play their life so that they have the least amount of time possible with Rafters control as an attacker, which is great for you as a defender. But there are certain places where you don't need to play your life and you don't need to risk your life taking as many gunfights as possible and you can just back up and give them free space. And this is actually 90% of the positions that you hold. A lot of people think that it's about a 50-50 split, but that's just not true. There's about 1 in 10 positions in the game of Siege that you actually need to play your life in. I think there's only 1 to 2 per map, to be completely honest. Most of the time, as a roamer or as an anchor, if someone is pushing you or droning you heavily and you know that you might die, you can easily just back up, give them that space, and then waste even more time. 
because as a defender, wasting time is your friend if you want to give them the least amount of time to do their job as an attacker. But let's say that you need to play your life or you're stuck in a position where you need to take a gunfight. Then this next mistake, which is playing too close to what you're playing off of, is really going to mess you up if you do it. Now, this seventh tip is all about positioning in a gunfight. I've talked about this time and time again in countless videos of mine. So let me bring you in game to show you what I'm talking about. So let's say you're playing Warden and you're playing inside of Basement for Oregon. Now, if you're trying to contest attackers that are coming down into Freezer and you want to swing them, swinging close to the head holes like this or off the reinforcement like this is actually bad. What you want to do instead is back all the way up to here and take that gunfight instead. Now, why do you want to be far away from whatever you're swinging instead of close to whatever you're swinging? Well, for starters, it makes you look smaller. Anything that's closer to you makes you look bigger. As you can see from the bomb, it's close to me, it looks pretty big. But if I run all the way back over here, it definitely looks smaller. That's just how perspective in real life and in-game works. But also for the simple fact that if you're peeking off of something, let's say right now, I'm standing exactly like this. I'm not fully peeking because I don't want to expose myself quite yet, but I will peek soon whenever I go for the gunfight. Well, if I'm doing this, they can actually see the left side of my body. They can see my feet and they can see my shoulder from all the way over there. And I can't see them. But if you back up all the way, that's not the case. They can only see you whenever you actually wide swing. So whenever you're taking a gunfight, if you have the option to safely do so, you should back up off of whatever you're swinging to give you an advantageous gunfight and make you a harder target to see and to hit. But a mistake that just as many players make is not matching the pace of your team. So we talked about in my fourth tip where you might be picking the wrong operators and you might just be stuck in spawn when your teammates are in sight. Well, that's mainly what this mistake is about, but it's a little bit different here. Let's say that you do have the right operator selection. You're playing a Finko when everybody on your team is rushing, but you still need to match the pace of your team. Whenever your team is roam clearing or they're trying to get to sight, they may be playing super passively to set up for their rush. You as a player trying to support them though, are still playing rush heavy operators and you're playing way too quickly. You should really look at the pace of your team. If they're droning or if they're holding angles, maybe you should drone for them or hold angles as well. If they're starting to run in or they're starting to get more aggressive, then you should match their aggression. Having a team that has mixed objectives that are playing at a different pace will only separate the gunfights more and give the defenders more 1v1s. The same thing goes for defense. If your team on defense is playing super, super passively only holding angles, then there's probably a reason for it. And as a newer player, you should really go to just match what they're doing and match their pace. If they're being super aggressive, there's also a reason for that. Maybe they're down in man count. So you should really match their pace as well to refrag them in case they die in the gunfight that they're trying to take. Matching the pace of your team is very, very important if you want to win the game, especially if you're a new player and you don't understand why they're playing the pace that they're playing. Even if they're doing it for a bad reason and they're not supposed to be as aggressive as they are, it's better for you to help them in that aggression so that they don't just throw their life away meaninglessly than for you to just let them die. Matching your team's aggression, especially if you're a solo queue player, is very important and very underutilized in the Siege community. But if you're being too aggressive, then you might make this next mistake, which is exposing yourself to too many angles. To show you this, I brought you back onto Oregon, but as an attacker this time, let's say for a moment that you're attacking meeting and kitchen and you have dining control already. But wait, there's an enemy in kitchen contesting you and there's an enemy in shower hall. You're getting pinched right now. Now, as an attacker, if you make the mistake of exposing yourself to both angles, you will inevitably die. This is what most players do. Instead, what you want to be doing is utilizing natural cover to only expose yourself to one place at a time to take 1v1s instead of taking a 2v1 like in this scenario. So again, if there's a player in shower hall and there's a player in kitchen, whichever one is aggressing you the most that you know you're going to have the first gunfight with is the one that you want to take the gunfight with, obviously, right? So using this natural cover here, I can use the table to cut this doorway off so they can't see me and I can't see them. And now I can easily take the gunfight on the person on this door. But if this person's being passive or maybe they were faking their aggression and now they backed up, then I would move and I would use this table to cover that door now. And then I would take this gunfight over here, right? So you can use natural cover or utility for that matter, like if you're playing a zombie on defense or smoke on defense, to cut off lines of sight or cut off enemy rotations to give yourself easy 1v1s. This is very powerful and something that you should start doing and not doing it is a mistake that a lot of people make that end up losing you gunfights and losing you games. Now, I just talked about smoke earlier, but we haven't actually talked about smoke grenades because a lot of people use them wrong. What most people will do whenever they smoke off lines of sight to, let's say, you know, get the bomb down, they end up throwing smoke grenades incorrectly. 
Now, the common head hole setup here, where you have head holes right here, a reinforcement here, and the doorway here, is a great sight setup for defenders. As an attacker, you mainly want to smoke this off to make it to where they can't peek you. A lot of people will end up smoking, like, right about here. This smoke grenade, if it lands right here, when you're planting, will cover the head hole and it will cover the door, but it's way too close to you. So if you couldn't tell already, the mistake is putting smoke grenades way too close to you. Now, as a defender, this smoke grenade, if it was still there, lol, it went out, will easily allow you to get control and get space. Pretend the smoke grenade is still here, right? I can easily just take all of this space because the smoke grenade is protecting me from an attacker line of sight, right? Now, what you want to do is throw the smoke grenade at the defender like you were throwing a normal grenade at them you want to be throwing it actually at the line of sight that they'd be using. So let's say that I want to plant- oh, I mess it up. Let's try that again. Pretend that you're planting, like, right here in the default plant. Instead of putting a smoke close to you, which we talked about being bad because it gives defenders free space, you want to throw it actually at the head holes, where the defender is. What this does is it makes it to where any defenders that are on the head holes, they can't easily just push up, because now you have attackers that are right next to your plant helping you out, or you as the planter can get off the plant and shoot them. They can't take any free space here. So you just never want to have smoke grenades super close to you, or god forbid you try to plant inside of a smoke and make it to where defenders can easily just retake and knife you whenever you're trying to plant. Don't do that, throw smoke grenades at the line of sight, and then you should be good. But smoke grenades aren't the only secondary gadget that you're using wrong. I can guarantee you that you're also using and placing claymores incorrectly as well. Now let's take cafe for example. Pretend that you're pushing third floor and you want a claymore for red stairs so that nobody flanks you from below you. Now most players will just put a claymore like this. Now this claymore in terms of like the intent behind it is not terrible, but look at how easy it is to spot. Any defender trying to flank you will easily see this and just shoot it. And as you can see by placing a claymore, there's three very distinct lines. There's one in the middle, one on the left diagonally, and one on the right diagonally. Now what you want to do when placing a claymore is try to make the middle of the claymore face the actual thing you're putting the claymore next to. For this example, it would be the pillar. When I make the middle face the pillar, you might think, well, all the lasers won't be seen. But as you can see, the left laser is still there. And as long as there's one laser that gets tripped over, the claymore will still explode and kill the person that's trying to flank. This is much harder to see much much harder to see now it is blue because i'm an attacker but as a defender this line will be a dark deep and hard to see red and on red stairs that will be even harder to see as well as opposed to something with three lines like this that's way easier to see compared to just the one line right here this gets me a lot of kills and you should definitely try it another tip about this as well is you can place another claymore behind this claymore and what this will do is whenever they shoot this claymore, a lot of people, whenever they shoot one claymore, they'll immediately just walk up. And then because they do that, they'll get trapped by the second claymore behind the first one. And you can actually get a pretty free kill from it. So if you're not planning on using your second claymore, you also should try that out as well. Now, in terms of gadgets, that's just scratching the surface of utility that you're probably using incorrectly. So let's talk about some primary abilities, specifically ones that create vert like buck, sledge, and ram. Now, I'm not saying necessarily that you're using the operator incorrectly, but let's take this for example. Try to find the issue here. I, as a sledge, am pushing kitchen trying to make vert. Look what I do. Immediately, take the gunfight. Now, what's bad about what I just did? Is it the placement of my vert? Is it how quickly in the round I made my vert? No, it's actually the fact that I peeked off of my vert and tried to take a gunfight. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't take gunfights off of your vert. I'm just saying that you shouldn't take them immediately off. Instead of placing one vert down and then immediately taking the gunfight off of it what you should instead do is place all the vert that you plan on using so i'll place this one then i'll place this one i'll place this one and notice i'm not peeking off of any of it i'm just placing the vert down so that i can use it later i've made that vert i've made this vert i'll even make a rotate for myself here so i can get even more vert on the rotate here i'll open up some walls i'll make the vert here hell i can even go over here and open up a hatch Right, so I'm just getting all of it done and out of the way. The reason that you do this is because if you die whenever you peek your first vert hole, then all your team has for vert is just one hole that they can peek off of. That's not good. Another reason that you don't want to be peeking immediately after you make vert is because when you make vert, it makes so much sound. So if a defender hears and sees you make vert above them, they're immediately going to peek it and try to take the gunfight. But if you make a bunch of vert like I did here, they don't know where you're going to peek from and where you're going to pop out next. So they won't be able to react to you when you spot them and then take the gunfight. 
So you want to be placing your vert and then peeking off of it. You never want to peek off of it immediately after you make the vert or else you will die and lose every single gunfight. Another piece of utility that you're probably using wrong is deployable shields. Let's take this base shield for example. Commonly, people will put a shield right here to face anybody trying to peek the door and the window. This shield is really good, but the actual placement of its exact location is bad. You never want to place it on a door frame like this. In fact, you never want to place it against a surface that you're playing off of in general. What this does is it makes it to where if people want to destroy the deployable shield, they can easily just put a grenade next to the deployable shield like this, and the ADSs that are typically back here won't get the deployable shield and save its life. But if you back the deployable shield up just like this, any ADSs that are near you and where you're playing, like ones on this wall or ones on this floor, will easily save the shield, and it won't have the problem of being on the doorway. Not only is putting it on the doorway bad for it getting grenaded, but also, if you put a deployable shield on a door just like this, it makes it to where if you want to use this door to rotate into the site, you have to vault over, which is bad because it locks you in an animation and it slows you down heavily, making it to where you can't take reliable gunfights, and it makes a lot of noise. The same thing goes for putting it on surfaces that you're trying to peek off of. Let's say you put a deployable shield right here because you want to face the hallway just like this. Putting it right here, again, is not good, because if you want an ADS to catch any grenades on the shield, you'd have to put it right here, which they can easily, easily shoot. But if you back the deployable shield up just like this, now you can put a ADS right here, and that will easily catch the grenades and the attackers can't see it. Not only this, but because it's backed up, you can easily get angles from the left side of it to anybody trying to push the hallway, just like that. So it's always better to back up your deployable shields rather than putting it on surfaces just like that. But that's enough about actual utility. Let's talk about gunfights instead. What a lot of people do wrong in gunfights is reloading their primary mid gunfight. This is bad, because what this does is it makes it to where anyone that is in the gunfight with you that you're going against can easily push you whenever you're reloading. Also, given the fact that they recently nerfed reloads to where you can't just stop the reload animation and have all your bullets magically reappear into your magazine, now you're really stuck in an animation you can't get out of with one bullet in your chamber. So instead, what you want to do is you need to be using your secondary. A lot of people don't use their secondary guns a lot, especially if it's not the actual primary source of gunfights like it is with the SMG-11 shotgun combo on SAS Operator. If you're out of ammunition with your primary, it takes more time to reload with your primary than it does to just switch to your secondary to get your kill. This can save your life a lot of times, especially if you have a low ammo weapon like Yana's ARX with only 21 bullets. A secondary gun can easily mitigate the fact that your primary runs out of ammo and because it's so switched to quick to you can easily get kills and this can easily save your life especially compared to the fact that if you don't and you reload you'll probably end up dying now that's 14 out of 16 tips so we're almost there and the 16th tip i guarantee you you do so you need to stick to the end the 15th mistake that i see every player making is they're not pacing themselves in terms of aggression with man count let me explain so in Rainbow Six Siege, it's a 5v5 game. Now, the more players that are alive on your team, the more of an advantage you have because it's more players that can shoot the enemies, right? So naturally, if you're in a 5v4 or a 5v3 scenario or a 4v3, whatever, you have more people on your team than their team, you're going to have an advantage. Now, if you have an advantage as an attacker or a defender for that matter, then you want to be playing passively and you want to be utilizing utility specifically to get the job done. The reason you want to play passively when you're up in man count is because you've already gotten the kills, so there's no reason to be aggressive and try to get kills and make up for man count when you're already up in man count. Now, this would be the time to start droning, to slow down, to use utility, and to actually kind of pace yourself a little bit more. This is especially prominent on defense specifically. If you're on defense and you're up in man count, the attackers have to come to you. They have to plant the bomb. There's no reason you should be taking gunfights, peeking anything, or holding any angles at all you're up in man count they have to come to you now if you're down in man count you want to be aggressive because if they have that advantage of having extra players then they're going to pinch the site and they're going to rush you because even if they lose the gunfight they have two to three other teammates that can easily refrag them and kill you it's so much harder to take a 1v3 than it is to take a 1v1 so anybody that's smart on attack or on defense for that matter when they're down in man count they're going to get aggressive to even that man count back down so that they don't get swarmed on site so in terms of your aggression, when should you be aggressive, when should you be swinging, and when should you be sitting on site playing passive, a golden rule is just to use the man count. If you're down in man count, you should be aggressive. If you're up in man count, you should be passive. Now we're on our final tip. I guarantee you, you don't do this correctly because it's a new update. What I'm talking about is the grenade rework. If you don't know with the new patch, grenades just got reworked, so you can't cook them anymore. But even so, there's still a way that you can make them detonate faster than normal, which is just bouncing them off of the floor. 
If you bounce a grenade off of the floor, the second that the grenade hits the floor, the fuse time is actually reduced, making it explode faster. So if you're trying to kill a player, you can easily just bounce the grenade on the floor next to them and it will give them less time to react and run away, giving you a free kill. A lot of people think that using grenades to get kills is completely dead, but if you use this tip, that's not actually the case. But with that out of the way, that is it for this video. My name is Alka and check out this next video on your way out. Later.